Augie and I are joining you from the fabulous studio at Casa Richard Productions, aka our living room in lovely far south Austin. And from across Texas, let's see what CTG viewers spotted in their late summer, early fall gardens. First, let's answer some questions. In Van Alstein, Jennifer Vince Rexick and her husband planted some gorgeous red orange cannas this summer. Then they noticed that one had a small section of yellow petals with a smattering of red orange splotches. Jennifer reports that this only happened once and the rest of the flowers have been the original color. And we received a similar question from Ivan, whose various zinnias were showstoppers all summer long, including one oddity from a normally red flowering plant that suddenly popped up a half red, half white with red splotches bloom. How cool! The anomalous behavior in both plants is the result of a somatic mutation, spontaneously occurring for unknown reasons in only one or a few cells, resulting in those cells expressing different physical characteristics than the rest of the plant. In horticulture, this new tissue, especially if it's aesthetically pleasing and can be propagated and maintained by asexual propagation, is known as a sport or a chimera. Somatic mutations aren't inheritable, so their characteristics aren't passed down to any offspring. And this anomaly may or may not ever appear again in your plants. So thanks for catching it and sending such great photos our way, Jennifer and Ivan. Interestingly, the Vince Rexix also planted zinnias and snapped this lovely shot with a sweet little skipper butterfly visiting. Butterflies really go for zinnias. This monarch stopped by Stephen Brigitte Tannen's garden in late summer. In September, many of us welcomed a barking puppy. Part two. In September, many of us welcomed much needed rainfall, a blessing for late summer flowering plants like oxblood lilies also often called schoolhouse lilies. These striking beauties have perennialized for Rose Polkowski, returning year after year to brighten her garden. Jordan Brewer got a really big surprise from his elephant ears that produced seeds. 14 inches of rain fell in three days just outside Meridian, where 10-year-old Isabella Strickland was on the spot to grab a shot of these cool mushrooms. She and her granddaddy, Don Fisher, watch CTG together every Saturday. CTG gardeners are really good at getting great shots of wildlife too. In Horseshoe Bay, Summer Puglisi captured this sequence of an anole shedding its skin. A pair breeds on her back porch and Summer reports that it's great fun to see the little babies running around. In San Antonio, Elisa Partosa has lots of garden friends too. One morning, she spotted a skimmer dragonfly on her eggplant and a black swallowtail near the parsley, which is one of their host plants. George Paul also spotted his first skimmer dragonfly. A polyphemus moth, one of the giant silk moths, took a plumbago break in Twinkle and Mark Schwinn's garden, and their cat decided to jump into the gardening game too. Camille Feliz has become a dedicated gardener since returning to Texas from New York City, and she reports that one of her favorite fall plants is Mexican bush sage, beloved by migrating hummingbirds and butterflies. Native Salvia coccinea seeded lavishly in Keisha and Dave Lamb's College Station Garden. This self-seeding annual always brings in the bees, butterflies, and hummingbirds. Back to Jennifer and Van Alstein. She and her husband planted a variety of sunflower seeds. Pollinators love the nectar and pollen buffet, while birds fly over for eventual seeds. A bumblebee nestled into a passion vine flower in Robert Mangum's Mills County Garden. And Angela Carver's habitat garden is buzzing with bees too. In Bastrop, Dorothy Matlock's daturas bustled with bees on over 50 flowers. Dorothy gleefully shared that it sounded like a beehive when she walked up to the garden to take pictures. When she moved to Bastrop, Dorothy's mom sent her seeds and cuttings of the plant she loved and knew as moonflower, but they never flourished in Dorothy's sandy soil, constantly covered in pine needles. A couple of years after the Bastrop complex fire, a datura started reappearing in her neighbor Hubert's garden. Dorothy collected seeds from him, and now the plants show up in different parts of her garden every year. Many plants that bloom at night are referred to as moonflower. Ana and Julio Lopez also sent in photos of their moonflower, but this is the annual vine, Ipomia alba. Another lovely vine is their lavender clematis. 
A candlestick plant lights up the side of the house, and they also grow fragrant Morea paniculata that they call Limonaria for its delightful citrus-scented flowers. Night-blooming cereus also glow by moonlight, attracting bat and moth pollinators. Hayden Holloway reports that in San Padre, his magnificent plant of the night grows on an oak tree. From Houston, Charles Chestnut sent this magnificent flower on his night-blooming cereus plant growing in a container. In East Austin, Robert Villarreal's garden is busy with hummingbirds on his flame acanthus, Anisacanthus quadrifidus variety bridei, and bees are all over the firebush, Hamelia patens. His garden is very fragrant too, with all kinds of mints, basil, and rosemary. But some flowers, like those of Stapelia gigantea, aren't so fragrant to us. You can see why they were designated gigantea in Terry Beegler's photo. They're often referred to by the common name carrion plant for the scent of rotting meat wafting from their gigantic blooms, which entices flies to pollinate them. Mark Sepulveda started his plant only a year ago, and look at it now. And lastly, Janet Webb's stapelia gracefully cascades over the edge of its container and down its stand. As always, we love hearing from you, so please visit centraltexasgardener.org to send us your stories, photos, and videos.